a very big topic, lot, lots to get through. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with, with, with you though. Um, timing, the content paradigm is completely changed, hasn't it? It's, it's really moved. I think it would be fair to say that there's been a lot of change in the world of print and magazine publishing. I think that's the first thing to start with. And I think the, the previous delineation between kind of media owner and consumer and agency, that model doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. So when I look at a lot of the clients that we work with in terms of commercial partnerships, one of the things that they do all have in common is the fact they talk about kind of a frictionless experience for their consumers. So there isn't an expectation that we just do the inspiration and the curation of content. And then there's this kind of amorphous space, which is kind of, you know, selling stuff. That, that world doesn't work anymore. Effectively, what we as a business have been doing is effectively saying, you know, we should operate on both levels. We can do inspiration and consumer, and we can also do the commerce piece as well. So that's where, as a business, you'll notice a lot of the acquisitions that we've been doing, some of the launches that we've been working on, so things like um, Fabled with Marie Claire, I suddenly got Marie Claire that used to be just a print proposition, which then became print and digital, which now is a, a store and commerce experience that we have with Ocado, where that's digital and it's got a footprint in the West End as well. That's where you'll start seeing more of our brand approach to the world. I think one of the speakers yesterday brought up Fable, but just for, for anyone who, who wasn't aware, it's, it's a store, isn't it, which mimics the online beauty pages, effectively, uh, of Marie Claire, yeah. so everyone can, can, can try before they buy it. That it brings the magazine experience to life, sort of a, 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 a back to front way. But, but um, Genevieve, where you come from, it's, um, what, that's the mindset you've had from the start. It's not about the old and the new, because you started off, a, it started off Pop Sugar as, as a start -up. Correct. I mean, being digital native, you know, we're always thinking about how we can reach the consumer, wherever channel they are. And so, you know, what we've been talking about recently is that the home page, you know, the old day, the home page of the desktop is really now somebody's social feed. So you have to really make sure that you are always present be it from a content creation point of view. So from, for our side of Pop Sugar, we write, we have more of our 100 content creators who are writing content, 200, 300 pieces every day. So we wanna make sure that we're tailoring those specifically to the audience. But then when we're working with our advertisers, we're making sure that they're also able to be discovered in the same funnel that people are discovering their normal content. So kind of the lines are blurring a little bit with the whole creation of native. People don't want to know that they're being sold to anymore. It can be much more subtle. Um, and it's not just saying like, here's that bottle of water that I want to sell you. It's like, oh, I've been doing 20 push-ups today. Here's some water that I had afterwards. I mean, it's just, it's trying to make sure it's more part of the day-to-day. -day. Hang on a minute, I thought we said it was going to be subtle. <laughs> <laughs> But, but your, your, your audience, it, it's mainly... Yeah, so we're Gen Y, Gen Z, uh, millennial, uh, millennial and, and Gen Z women. So I mean, we reach more than 86 million women around the globe. And so we have, we very much know who they are. So we're very much research and insight driven. So everything that we do, we've created our own proprietary tool so we know exactly how things are accelerating, so we write content that's most relevant at that time. We, we know we're getting, it's kind of like a special sauce that we have, um, but we're using it because we know that we get more viewers, more readers, more video views um, by catering specifically to the interests of the readership. And are you finding that your campaigns have that a, a change? Are you catering to, to, to different, different audiences via different channels? Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest shift we've seen is, I mean, talking to those examples about how much content you're pushing out, think about for brands, and I'm sure it's put out to many people in the room, if you work on a brand, there's that requirement to constantly have content and constantly engage people. I think clients can potentially get lost in that, and they feel you should always be pumping things out, and you get to this sort of white noise, which I think everyone's trying to avoid. You want to keep that authenticity, keep being meaningful, but it's how you strike that balance with having enough things to say. And if you start the dialogue, continuing it with content versus going off in a totally um, meaningless direction and just putting noise out there. But if you have a, a, a client who has built up a, a, a huge um, profile on social media, for example, yeah. um, do they not have an expectation that there are, there are lots of people out there waiting for them to, to give something new, waiting for them to update their content? Or do you think brands are, are too focused on having something new too quickly? I, I think 
there are some brands who are in a very fortunate position where they have an inbuilt audience. I mean, all brands to some level will have fandom going on. The language we use is meaningful. So the idea is how are you meaningful, how are you relevant to people. Well, I think a lot of brands aren't cutting through at that, but if you can have that idea of meaningful, uh, it's quite a spacious word if you cut into it. It's where, do you, where does your product sit in the marketplace? What is the personal benefit you give to somebody? What's the collective benefit you give to uh, the peer group, the society as a whole, what do you do? And content can be a really useful way of doing that. Even if it's just putting a smile on someone's face, you've been meaningful. If you've done something helpful, or you've helped them do something quicker, better, or something in their life is simpler, that's useful. So I think it's maybe being wary of not rushing to just push stuff out there, but then think about what your audience actually want, and then delivering against that, and that's the, the easiest way to start navigating through content. Creating content for content's sake is where people fall down very, very quickly. Like I see so many people like, I have to put up three stories. I mean, I'm not talking about pop sugar, but you might have a brand, so I need to put up three things today. If they're not relevant to the end reader, nobody's gonna find it, right? The people who are very successful are because they're actually creating something that people want to consume. And so you just have to make sure that you're actually understanding what it is that people are wanting to read. So it's not just a case that they're not going to be able to find it, it also then dilutes the impact. Of, of what you've put out there, there before. Absolutely. What about this um, jumping on board with, with events with news? I mean, we were talking earlier about, about Wiggle and the, the, whole, um, the whole big focus in the UK um, on cycling, especially with, with Team GB. How did that campaign work? Well, I think it's definitely a vertical that I think have a lot of authenticity in. So if you look at a brand like Cycling Weekly that's been around for you know, in excess of 100 years, you know, I haven't seen the first cover, but I presume it's going to be a penny farm. But um, that particular brand knows that audience in space. So one of our acquisitions was buying a company called UK Cycling Events, which ran a series of sportifs across the UK, and, you know, I think extended into Europe. Because ultimately, we need to be where our consumers are. So if we're giving that inspiration piece around the type of bike you should get, or the right type of saddle, or the wireframe, etc., etc., it just seems like a very natural extension then to give them the tools and the ability to be able to find where they can engage their passions. And effectively, that is, as a media of what we're there to do. We're there to facilitate the passions. But to your point on kind of having almost like a, a content calendar of having to push out three stories a day, that can actually be incredibly counterintuitive yeah. because it almost works to the old traditional publishing model where effectively we are the holders and the creators and the owners of content and we've got a hypodermic syringe of content which we're feeding with you. But actually, that content conversation works two ways. So your consumers should be coming back to you and should be engaging with them rather than it being a kind of very formulated plan Push. It's just like a push email. Hmm. But there is, there is an expectation from consumers. You mentioned the, that old traditional publishing framework. The magazines still do it today. They're preparing their Christmas hmm. editions in, in July, aren't they? And that you know that in February it's all going to be hearts and flowers and valentines. And then they move on to Easter. And then you've got the back to school. And it, it goes around the, the calendar. Are you, are you saying that that's out the window? I think there are... I think one of the things that magazine brands do very well is reinvention. And it's very much a balancing act between, I don't know, the expectation from the audience to see familiarity, and on this side they want new. So it's the ability to be able to do that, and they've been doing it for an awfully long time. So those content calendars in terms of those moments yeah. are still relevant, but it's the way in which you interact with your consumers around those moments. So within a print perspective, yes, you may well have a Valentine special, but then from a social perspective, that could look like an anti-Valentine special, where on the actual day, it's all the things that if you're alone on Valentine's Day, actually is a social story of you know people telling us the things that they're doing which are anti-Valentine's Day. It's a two-way communication, whether you're a brand as a media owner, or a brand as a content creator. But I think you're creating an ecosystem. Yeah. I, I don't think it's just the content that exists. You know, I mean, we, as we said, you know, uh, we do a big thing at Coachella every year. It's kind of one of the big hip and happening parties that we have every year. That's like a big festival. Four years, it's a huge festival in the U.S. Everyone's prepping six months in advance for what are you going to wear at the festival. You know, you work with the retailers, you work with the brands, and then you create this experiential event 
that's seeding your content, that are engaging the, the readers. People want to be there, people want to see something, who's, you know, what is the experience? And I think what you're seeing is, is it no longer just sits in kind of the one dimensional form. It has to take on so many new forms. And I think the people who are being successful at it are not just seeing it as words on a written page or a screen, but it's making sure that the way that you're, and I'm using one of your words probably on your like bingo sheet, um, <laughs> engagement, um, you know, you're, it, it's really, it is about engagement. You want people to want to come back to your site every day. You want people to be consuming and looking at those nuggets and be it a brand advertisement that's in a native form or something that you're writing specifically for your own site. So you're balancing that familiarity and loyalty um, with, with, with oversaturation. But it's knowing, it's knowing who you're speaking to. And we were saying, talking about this when we were originally talking on the phone. It's not that you're hitting your whole 80 million person um, readership with the same piece of content. The way that you're successful is that you're finding those million, two million, five million, five hundred thousand, you know, piece stories or where people are coming to your stories and they're making kind of the amalgamation of what you are. And I just think that it, not one size fits all for everybody and you have to really understand what the end reader is. And in terms of not one size fits all, you, you, you've been doing some um, quite alternative kind of campaigns. I'm thinking about Domino's and, and yeah. the, the football sitcom. Tell yeah, about um, so Domino's is a great example. Domino's, um, my sister ABC Arena really look after that. And they have the whole proposition of greatness. So Domino's, think about it, used to be so heavily about price. You know, we would get, you know, this two for Tuesdays or family bundle deals. People always going to look for value. And I find this in so many different categories now. It's trying to move the conversation away from that race to the bottom on price to other values. And for Domino's, it was talking about the idea of greatness, the idea of, you know, their pizzas are the best tasting and fantastic, and associated with fun, um, great moments. And it started with things around football. It started around, uh, we created an online um, sitcom around football. But this year, it's moved more and more into influences. And it, it's, it's trying to get our messages across, but then involving influences. I think this is where the grace that these guys do comes in for, for the brands we work with is if you're a brand and you're trying to build your own media, that should be the aspiration. You should really be building your own platforms. But how do you get there? It's, it's, it's quite a long journey rather than just jumping to get an audience there and your you know, place got audiences built in. So say on Domino's you created a Snapchat filter around the, the delight you get when you taste Domino's and the crazy stuff to your face. Yes, we can put that out there, get people interested, it's great fun, you might find it on Snapchat. Likewise, we can talk to influencers, get them talk about it, talk to their engaged fan bases, and go in environments where people are. I think part of the content trick is recognizing where your audience are and taking it to them. We talked about that calendar before. So the way we tend to think about it is, yes, you have your calendar events, Valentine's Day, bank holidays, all those. You can plan for those, by all means. Then there are things you pretty much predict that people are going to want to talk about. So um, I work on Kia Cars, so you know, at the car show will come, people want to talk about that. Plate change days, people want to come. There will be certain themes going up on top here which might get into the, the public discourse. But then you have those sort of two strands, so planned and then the predictive. But then it's the reactive, what can you do very quickly? Um, a great example recently, um, Oscars and the Warren Beatty Faye Dunaway moment straight in there, should have gone to Specsavers, yeah. Specsavers did it, and that is just a wonderful, that brand has, has built, like, just because they've focused on that idea, and that idea is broken into pop culture, it gives them a license to do it. The word authenticity has come around the panel a lot already, we're only a few minutes in. If you, if you have that authentic, authentic message, it really helps you land what you're talking about, so for Specsavers, that's their absolute license to say that, so where many other people wouldn't cut through and fail, it just worked. There were a lot of memes out there. Of there? course, and everybody tries. Yeah. And it's like when April Fool's Day, every brand feels they have to try and do one. And I, I actually encourage our clients not to, to sort of step away from that because you just end up, it's, it's a beauty pageant and there can only ever be one winner. It's better to try and pull people in a different direction and stand out for something different. Yes, if it's a perfect fit, go for it, but don't feel sure you have to. So, how it changes agencies like us, we've had to um, totally restructure. For media agencies, we've been used to come to buy our media, that doesn't exist anymore. The amount of clients, and again, throws the room, it's the amount of clients in the conversation, well, you know, we hear about own, we hear about earn, we hear about paid, how do we reduce the reliance over here and move it further up there? And content is one of the biggest levers to allow you to do that. But it's, you have to have the authenticity, you have to work with partners to help you get the audience in, 
but then it's delivering something useful at the end of it. I'm talking about working with partners. Um, you've got the new venture with, with eBay, eBay Curve. So uh, eBay are one of our commercial content clients, and we produce content for them that runs on their own channels. So it's a really interesting proposition for us. So effectively using our branded content to power and drive their authenticity within the fashion space, specifically around plus size. Now, what was really interesting around that particular project is we spent a lot of time talking to clients about whether or not they have the relevancy and they have the consumer kind of agreement to talk in that space. Now, eBay isn't necessarily a brand that you would think about in terms of plus size fashion. They don't necessarily have the authenticity and the, the voice to be able to communicate with the audience in that space. But what we were able to bring through our brand is to say actually kind of plus size is a thing and it's a thing that we can talk about and as a fashion editor for you know, Woman Magazine or a fashion editor for Woman in Home or for America or in Style, we can talk about that topic because we have that credibility, authority and relevancy. So our brand and our voice within their channels allows them to drive consumer engagement, but also to change that perception of eBay. So one of the things we talked a little bit about is kind of, you know, how do we know that things work? Well, a piece of research on uh, a group that were exposed to that event versus unexposed. And actually there was a very significant shift in the way in which the exposed group had actually seen eBay in that fashion space. So it was statistically significant because it was in excess of 200% increase in terms of a positive engagement because they'd seen our brand aligned in that space and said actually that makes sense to us that we could go to eBay and feel comfortable about buying those items or those products because your editors have made that a credible space to appear. I'm talking about the authenticity and about those influences that you, you've got as part of your, your domain yeah. at Pop Sugar. I mean, how, if we had International Women's Day yesterday. I mean, how does womenomics come into it? Is that like a... How does women... Womenomics. A womenomics? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, it's, it's what drives the whole business. I mean, we're, I think, about 90% women who actually come to the site. So everything that we do is geared towards catering to women's passion points. We've already talked about this. I think everyone talks about the passion points and then how that you can actually get them to consume um, as a result of those passion points. Um, not necessarily that everything has to end in some transaction, um, but whatever the transaction is, be it them giving you time um, or actually purchasing something from um, one of your advertisers over time um, is something that I think you know makes us very, very well positioned. I mean, we've, we've been incredibly successful. I mean, um, we're a US-based company that we've been in the UK uh, producing content for the last couple of years. Um, but what you see in the US is that people know we are specifically targeted to a very specific demographic. They know that they don't have to really, you know, your, your advertisement or your campaign doesn't need to be broad reaching. They know exactly what it's, it's moving right. towards. And when we actually are creating kind of the ideation for creating campaigns, we're taking all the knowledge that we have about what people are reading, you know, how they're engaging. You know, so for instance, um, we've just run a campaign with an FMCG company here in, in the UK, and we know that kind of the, the do's and don'ts are always what people read do not do this or do this, and everyone wants to read those. So we actually created a series in which you're talking about, one of the, the videos that we created was about how to have a British tea party. And then the whole question that we had at the end was, where do you pour the milk into you know, your tea? And even though it was just very subtle, it was playing on this whole concept that we know by the way that people are engaging with our, co with our content. So, milk first. Milk first. Well, yeah. no, 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 it was milk no first. Yeah. Definitely, let's go first. Oh, yeah. and, and the finger, the finger, the finger up. up. Yeah. That's just true. <laughs> well, let's not get onto scars. Let's not get onto scars. specifically so that people would engage with it, right? So that when people are viewing it on Facebook or when people are on YouTube, that there is that debate. Do you put it in before? Do you put it in after? So it's kind of, it's subtle. And is it cream or jam on the scars yeah. first? But I'm um, trying you, um, I want to talk a little bit about your story as well because right now it's, you, you, you're in the, you're in the, the UK for yeah. Hot Sugar. You, you've worked in many different markets. You spent a long time in, in Germany. Yeah. You're working for a US company. Do, do this, do, does this dynamic change from, from region to region, from country to country? Is this, is this some places need to play catch up with others? Um, I would definitely say that 
look, the US tends to be leading the way. Um, I don't think the UK is far behind, and I would say if you were going between the US, UK, and Germany, I would say that was the order. US, UK, and Germany in terms of the adoption of the way that people and advertisers are engaging um, specifically with their viewers. Um, what you are seeing, what we've seen, there was probably about two years ago, and I think you guys can all talk about it too, <laughs> from the agency, especially in the US, um, where there was just a fundamental shift to native advertising. I think everybody it was like display, 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 and then all of a sudden, I don't know, the spigot kind of turned off and everybody realized they actually had to be more creative than just putting the creative and hoping that somebody visually sees it and they engage with it. And so now what you're seeing is the whole native video. I mean, we have more than 250, uh, actually it's 300 million video views per month now um, on the site. And it's just, you're having to find them where they want to be. And you're starting to see that now in the UK. We're just starting to see more and more video campaigns. I'm sure you guys see that. I, I would probably say a year or two years ago, it was a very, very, very small portion of kind of the advertising business online. And now you're seeing more and more people. It's not cheap, as everybody knows. And you can tell the difference when people are actually putting something together that has quality to it and that doesn't have quality, but you're seeing that shift. So, so lots of different media, but what about in the devices that people uh, are, in, are taking yeah. on board with? Because you, you, you talk about the quality, sometimes what you have on, on mobile and online, the quality is not the same as you might see on the screen. Is it all about mobile? Uh, mobile has made a fundamental change in everything. Um, I think it's a big challenge for advertisers. You still see a lot of advertisers throwing assets made for other channels onto mobile, which yeah. doesn't help. So thinking more mobile first and, and, and thinking in that portrait rather than the landscape and, and using that and using the stuff you know your smartphone can do is incredible you know GPS and things you can do with vibration and, and the way you can recognize things there's wonderful things you can do there not always the cheapest things to do there are there are clever ways of doing that I think it's all about navigating the right levers to use on it you almost start with a, a content idea and then which platforms does it go to and I think mobile is definitely something else to think about first so, so for example um, we work on Kia cars Look at the car buying process, how mobile has changed that is, is phenomenal. The amount of people seeing at home and researching on the devices. And the thing is, nobody else goes to a car dealership and feel like you don't know what you're talking about. So people do their research, they spend hours and hours. You see that the process takes hours. So there's less test drives, but the people going in for that one test drive are just super informed, which creates this huge challenge because we have uh, dealers in there who need to match that level of knowledge. And that's a huge depth and very specific knowledge that a customer goes in with having. So that's lots of change content, because you think about, people talk about content like hero, home and hygiene, that's absolutely relevant to how you should think about it. But it starts to pull it out, it pulls it out through the funnel. So you get your entertainment and your immersion right at the top, then you get the, the sort of content will educate and carry people through, they'll get an attraction, but then you need content for that final part of the funnel, the action that's gonna carry them over. So, for example, before people come to dealerships, we have to think about how that content exists on our, on our website and how they consume it there. But then there's the recognition that you know, people are so busy searching on their devices, they're not necessarily going to the car sites, they're going to more independent third party places. So that comes about working with partners and creating content for those moments. So, for example, in the last year, uh, we had a huge partnership in News UK on their driving platform, pushed out across the Sun and the Times, you know, bringing in celebrities, test driving the vehicles, taking the vehicles, showcasing them. We partnered with the Telegraph during the Euros, um, which went brilliantly well. So. That was the sports editor driving our new Kia Sportage around um, different sites within the tournament. But prior to that, it was also about creating content around the tournament, getting excitement there. We took uh, X. And by the way, we're driving this car. By the way, we're driving this car. We took X England legends into um, dealerships for live events. So it was an opportunity to involve the dealers. That's a huge part of being a car retailer getting people into the showrooms, they can actually physically see the cars, which for Kia we find is a great way of engaging people. If they see the, the metal, it really starts to sell them. But also that then generates content we can shout about and talk about our authenticity. Because we're um, a global partner of UA from FIFA, but how do you land that in the local country? It was a great way of doing that. So content, just if you pull it right through the funnel, serves so many different roles. And I think that's a huge challenge to help brands navigate through that. So the starting point is to find out what content you, you want yeah. and then to tailor it towards the different channels you've got. Absolutely. But I like this pulling out idea. Yeah. Just to, I was just going to say, it makes such a big difference. I mean, we, we know when we write our content, 
whatever image, um, you know, the, the subject matter, the subject line, we change it based upon where it's being consumed, right? And it's very specific in the CMS where it's being presented that it's not the same in every place where it's located. They're actually thinking about tailoring it specifically for where the end user is going to consume the content. So it's different in terms of location, it's different in terms of devices, and it's evolving all the time. And timing as well. Yeah. I think that does play a part. And one of the conversations we have internally quite a lot is the difference between science and magic. So there was magic. so magic. magic. You know, so there are so many tools with which we are able to see uh, the, the, the content funnel and how it's going to be consumed, distributed, etc., etc. And effectively, if you're a content creator and you want to get people to engage, really and truly, there are probably only two things you need to put into the headline. One, Kardashian, and secondly, Man United. <laughs> that's the science piece. Yeah. The magic that's happens. the science. That's the science. The magic piece is kind of the editorial team going, actually, if everyone's looking left, why don't we go right? And I think that's the, the really interesting piece kind of being in this kind of media over landscape is how that is demonstrably changing. The fact that we're having to use that data but also sometimes be actually counterintuitive to that data as well. Because by being counterintuitive, by being different, you actually stand out more rather than just kind of following the also, way the crowd goes. But it also is not looking always internally at yourself and your own data. Because that's the one of the things that we spend a lot of time working on as a tool that goes to 200 different websites or 200 different content creators. So you need, you need to keep it very much. Well, what you're focused. doing is, is you're looking at those 200 different creators. You're looking at their, we look at their lit last 250 pieces of content that's being created. We're looking at all the social engagements that are happening with those 250 pieces of content and understanding specifically what's interesting and what's not interesting from that. And is there a theme? Is there a topic? Is there something specific? And then trying to figure out kind of what you're saying, it's like, it's more the, the magic part is like trying to pick the nuggets out that actually place you to being ahead of the game versus just following what everybody else is doing. So leading the charge. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, Mark, and Rick, thank you very much. It was a really upbeat discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.